One paper published by a Duke University researcher found that over 40% of the actions people perform every single day aren't actual decisions, but habits. So with that being said, there's really nothing you can't do if you get the habits right. But the problem is a majority of people get the habits wrong. They fall into self-destructive behavior. And we know this because 95% of the population lives in mediocrity. So how exactly do we get our habits right? How exactly do we live a life that is filled with abundant, healthy habits? Well, let's look at the science behind it. Deep inside our brain, close to the brain stem, is where our automatic behaviors are controlled. And at the center of the skull is the basal ganglia. Actually, I think it's pronounced basal ganglia, my bad. This serves to internalize the thing that we do. So it's really central in recalling patterns and acting on them. In other words, it stores habits. And it does this through this method called chunking, which is converting a sequence of actions into a routine, an automatic routine. And that is the root of how habits are formed. The interesting thing about the brain is that it tries to turn any routine that you do into a habit because the brain is designed to make you comfortable, not happy. Habits allow our minds to ramp down more often. It saves the brain effort so it can devote mental energy to other things, to other unfamiliar things. So what exactly is the precursor then to the routines that we act out? Cues. And this is the very first component in what I'm about to present, a habit loop. Habits are essentially a three-step loop. The first thing in the loop is the cue. The cue is the trigger that tells your brain to go into automatic mode and what habit to use. So this could be a person, a place, a time of day, a thing, etc. And then what follows is a routine, which could be physical. So it could be something that you act out, a behavior. It could be mental, a thought that you think or slash and emotional, a feeling that you feel. And then after you conduct this routine, you get a reward from it. And this helps your brain figure out if the loop is worth remembering for the future. Over time, this loop becomes automatic, which is why habits are so powerful. Remember, over 40% of our actions are habits, not actual decisions. We begin to associate cues with rewards, which creates a neurological craving in our brain to act out on that cue every time it is presented to us. Because it's gradual usually and over time, we have a lack of self-awareness of how we ended up here, why we do what we do. We're like, hey, how did I become a stoner? How did I become so addicted to social media or addicted to my phone? We can't even track that down because literally it's over time. So we lose that sense of self-awareness and realization and power even because we're on idle pilot. We're literally acting out from impulse and we don't even realize it. But now that we are aware about the nature of habits and how they are a loop, since I just informed you about this loop, <laughs> we can begin to change our habits now that we have this awareness. The key word here that I want you to pay attention to is change, not break, because contrary to popular belief, habits cannot be broken. They can only be changed. So here's how to change a habit. I'm not gonna go into much detail. I'm going to provide a broad explanation, but then later on in the video, I'm going to really hone in on the details for each step. Basically, in a nutshell, you need to keep the same cue, but swap out the routine, okay? The problematic behavior, emotion, etc., for something that is going to still give you the same reward that that self-destructive behavior was giving you. Or, ideally, a better reward. Here's the simplistic rundown of the steps. First, you need to create a list of all of the triggers for your problematic behavior. So say you are addicted to vaping, you're addicted to nicotine, and you think to yourself, okay, what are my triggers? Well, an obvious one could be seeing a puff, seeing a jewel, seeing a Soren, whatever device is trending nowadays. I mean, it's always changing. With Every six months, I feel like someone is smoking something new. Like the puffs now are a thing of the past. Now it's all about those little glass things. Anyway, I digress. But write down exactly what your triggers are. That's an obvious one. I don't have a nicotine addiction. So um, with that one, I'm not sure. But 
I'm going to tell you a personal example from something that I was addicted to, which is marijuana, okay? My trigger, my cue happened to be a person, a friend that I love dearly, but for some reason, since she was and still is a heavy cannabis user, every time I saw her, every time we hung out, I felt compelled to smoke with her, to, you know, blaze it or don't blaze it. So <laughs> um, she ended up being a trigger. So really think to yourself, who, what is the cue here? Are there more than one cues? Maybe it's also a time of day, like, hmm, 420, you know, like I just said, 420, if you're a stoner and you're trying to break this self-destructive behavior, because hey, here's the thing. Cannabis isn't for everybody, okay? It's not for everybody. And contrary to popular belief and popular opinion, it is addictive. I said it, you know, don't find me on it. That's just what I think. So write down exactly what your cues are and pay attention to when you are craving or wanting to act out on this self-destructive behavior. When you have the impulse, take note of what time of day it is, the environment you're in, who you're with, what you're wearing, like everything, anything can be a factor. And you don't even know, remember, because we're on autopilot here with these habits. So you really need to be observational and take everything into consideration. Then the second thing that you need to do is you need to search for the rewards, okay? So why exactly are you acting out on this self-destructive behavior? Hmm, well, for me, I was smoking because I wanted to feel connected with my friends since my friend was the trigger. See, this is a very unique situation for me. But for most people, a friend or a human being, excuse me, isn't the trigger. It could be like, well, no, it's just, it really is the plant. It really is the power of the weed. I just, you know, I'm chasing that, that feeling when I first smoked, that feeling of euphoria, happiness. That's why I keep doing it because the very first time I did it, that's what I got. But over time, you know, with my tolerance, yeah, I still feel happy when I smoke, but not that same, not that same level of happiness. So that's true for a lot of people, even, you know, with nicotine too. Like, yeah, you know, it's just like, nothing's like that, that first draw of the cigarette or that first hit of the puff, waking up first thing in the morning. Like there's some people that do that. I don't get how you do that. It dehydrates me, the nicotine, but some people it's like, boom, why wouldn't they wake up? And they, they're, they're hitting these things all day, every day. But for some reason, that first hit, they're like, it's uncomparable. It's like, that is the one that's going to be the best hit uh, out of the whole day. So write down the rewards. They really think, what what is the reward I'm getting? Is it euphoria? Is it connection with other people? Is it validation? Is it that my social inclusion needs are getting met? You know, really think with the latter two points um, and examples, I think that could be tied with social media. So really think, what exactly are my rewards? Okay. And then step three is to create a new routine that matches those rewards that are almost equivalent to those rewards that the self-destructive behavior was giving you and better yet offers more rewards. Taking the time to do this and be observational is crucial because we don't understand the cravings that are driving our behavior until we deliberately look for them. But even when we find them and we recognize them and we realize them, it's very important to note that a habit won't be changed just by writing these things down and making a habit loop for yourself based on whatever habit it is that you wanna change. No, it's still gonna take a lot of determination. No one's gonna quit smoking simply because they sketched out a little habit loop. But replacement habits only become durable and sturdy when accompanied by not just determination, but belief. And what exactly creates belief when you don't really believe in yourself? Other people, okay? So this is why AA is a thing, right? It's a community effort. You're all going through it. You're all uplifting each other up. You don't feel so isolated and alienated because you're having a similar experience with somebody else. So find a community, find forums. If you think going to something in person is a little bit too outside of your comfort zone, just 
find a way to connect with an individual, whether in person or online, that can give you a sense of accountability that, okay, hey, they are checking in on me, like have an accountability partner or a group, like, okay, if I screw up, there are going to be consequences for my actions because this isn't just a me thing. This is like a group thing. We're all in this together. So I really need to show up for myself or else I'm going to let somebody else down and I don't want to do that. So if you don't have a friend to do this for you, I think it's honestly better to have a stranger because sometimes a friend can give you the benefit of the doubt and they can be easier on you. So if you find a stranger online, then they're more likely to be harder on you because they don't have that emotional attachment with you. It's going to be hard realizing what triggers you, but you need to consciously accept that this is going to be a hard journey, a hard path to walk down. Believe you have self-control. So now let's go over the framework and each step with more detail. So first, we're going to identify the routine, aka the behavior that you want to change. Then the second thing is you need to experiment with the rewards. Is it the weed itself? Is it the temporary sense of relaxation? Is it escapism that I'm looking for? Is it this sense of euphoria that I'm looking for? Is it socialization? Is it to feel included with my friends, feel like I belong, feel connected with them? There's usually going to be four to five. So make sure you take into consideration all of them and jot all of them down and really be aware of all the possibilities because this will allow you to isolate what you are actually craving. Then you're going to experiment with new routines that are not self-destructive, that are actually healthy and serving and fulfilling in your life. And by experimenting with them, you are going to, once again, be able to determine which one is going to offer the best return on your investment, which one is going to match the rewards that that self-destructive behavior was giving you and ideally give you more rewards. Once again, you need to write down all of these things within each step. Then after completing each routine, you need to take time to jot down how it made you feel right then and there in the moment, right when it's fresh in your brain, fresh in your head. Okay. Trying to be as present as possible is very crucial for your success in changing your destructive behavior because it is only after writing down how each routine made you feel that you will be able to compare routines and really see which one is giving you the reward that the self-destructive behavior was giving you. So just write down the first three things that come to your mind right then and there. Boom. Then I want you to set a 15 minute alarm after trying out each new routine. And once the alarm goes off, ask yourself, hmm. Am I tempted? Do I really want to do this self-destructive behavior that I have a neurological craving for? Do I still want to fulfill this problematic routine? So those are the steps, but I really want you to be easy on yourself. This is a message that I really want to burn into you. Think of yourself as a scientist in the data collection stage because essentially the experiment that you're conducting is trying to achieve self-awareness about the rewards that are driving your behaviors so don't think of a relapse as a failure please don't do that because then you're just going to continue to do the self-destructive behavior and think eh, what's the point like this is just who i am no 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 i want you to always think of it as just a routine that wasn't good, a failed routine that wasn't as good as the original routine, the self-destructive routine. If you relapse, that simply means, okay, I just need to find a better routine, a more ideal routine. The one that I just conducted wasn't good enough. That's why even after 15 minutes, my alarm went off, I still was compelled to execute that problematic behavior. Trying out different routines allows you to test different hypotheses. OK, so once again, I'm going with this experiment theme here, the scientist theme here. So don't be so hard on yourself. You're simply in a lab. Writing leads to awareness, which leads to recollection oh, of why you do what you do, which leads to power. 
I hope that this video helped. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, insights, thoughts, whatever, leave them down below. And if you dislike this video, then dislike it so that I know what I need to do in the future. And also leave, you know, some criticism of what I need to improve on. So I know. Okay, that's all. Thank you so much for watching.